The weekly Industry Angel podcast hears from business leaders and entrepreneurs who share their stories and that all-important light bulb moment. This can inspire us all and maybe scratch that itch and kickstart that idea that keeps you awake at night. Welcome to episode eight of the Industry Angel. Well, today's budget day here in the UK, and whilst I speak to you, Chancellor George Osborne will be sharpening his axe, Westminster will be bubbling with speculation. Our nation's debt stands at an enormous 1.6 trillion. It's going to be an interesting one, but by the time you hear this, it'll all be over. But anyway, back to more important matters. Here in the Northeast, we have a very strong tech scene. And we've had requests and guest suggestions to hear from one of our successful companies. We have a guest today that surely fits that bill. Today we have the CEO of Zero Light. Welcome to Industry Angel, Darren Joblin. Good morning. How are you doing? I'm all good. Now, Darren, I recently did an internet search and I typed in perfect job role and it came back with C. Darren Joblin. (laughs) (laughs) Now, now, do you want to tell the listeners why or should I? Uh, Possibly you should, I think. Ah, right. I was afraid of that. Um, well, our town motto here in South Shields is always ready. So here goes. I've got something prepared. Let me know how it go. Essentially, the guys at Zero Light use the latest digital display and experience technology to develop an advanced car configuration solution. How's that? Yeah. So, so that's pretty good. I think, right. I, but... I, I think, I mean, <laughs> basically, the, the problem that Zero Light solves is whenever you go to buy a new car, especially if you're going to order one, you can never see the car you're going to buy. It's always, it looks like that one over there, but yours is silver and that one's blue. That one's got the bigger alloy wheels. Yours will have little alloy wheels. And it's just a really, really bad consumer experience. So fundamentally what we're doing is solving that problem so the consumer can see the exact car that they're ordering. And it's really a big part of the revitalization of the automotive buying process is really what we're involved in. So where, where did that come from? You said there was a problem there or a challenge. Did someone come to you, Darren, or did you guys suddenly, suddenly think about this? Or? I, I wish I could say it was a, a stroke of entrepreneurial genius, but it wasn't. Uh, fundamentally, IBM rang us up. And um, so this was when we were uh, Eutechnics, the game company. And Eutechnics have been doing driving and racing games for about the last 16 years at this time. And IBM had got the gig to deliver a, a digital showroom for the launch of the Jaguar F-Type. So they'd rang up Microsoft, obviously they did the uh, Forza games, and Microsoft said they weren't inter- interested. They rang up Sony, the Gran Turismo people, and they said they weren't interested. But they said, however, there is a really good independent company in the UK that we've dealt with in the past called Eutechnics, and you should look them up. So literally one afternoon, the first time in 25 years, um, somebody says, oh, there's somebody from IBM on the phone wants to speak to you. And I thought, oh, I'll take that call. And uh, and and the rest is the rest is pretty much history, to be honest. Right. When was that, Darren? Uh, that was in 2012. So the literally right. was in, in the summer of 2012. So about May or June, and it needed to be done by um, the September of Paris Motor Show. So literally, from having nothing, we created a digital showroom within uh, three months. Wow. Which was the, the F-Type, which at that, at that stage, the car was still under secrecy. So it was an F-Type, and it's all possible configurations for all markets. So you also have to, con- obviously, a big part of what we do is creating all the different bits to go into the car. So do you think IBM approached you guys knowing that you were an SME, agile, you know, rather than go to one of the bigger players that might have took way more than three months off? Well, I, th- I think what happens is, fundamentally, there's less than about five companies in the world that has the technology to do what we do and most of those companies are actually involved in the games industry so so obviously when they went to microsoft microsoft's interested in selling xbox consoles they're not really interested in jaguar selling um helping jaguar sell their cars however we were a bit um more agile more eager more open-minded and we just thought, hey, this could be a really, really good use of the technology because the technology has moved on such that the, the the quality of the car, the visual that you see, is actually pretty, to the average consumer, they think it's pretty excellent. So Paris Motor Show, wasn't it? Yeah, Paris Motor Show 2012. 
how did that go? Obviously, you had three months. What did, what did the end put it like? Were you happy with it? Or did you think, oh, I wish I'd had a bit more time? Or Yeah, no, I, I think we're really, really happy with it. So were uh, Jaguar and uh, infamously, obviously, one of the Tartar brothers that owns uh, Jaguar Land Rover came across to show somebody the interior of the F-Type, but the car was locked on the show floor. It was a consumer day. <laughs> so he came and operated the system and showed the person what the interior of the car was like in zero light. And I think that was a, that was a, a pinnacle moment where you think, hey, this, this, this could actually be something big. And what was his feedback? Did did he get a chance to speak or hear from what he what he was what his thoughts were? Yeah, I mean, he was doing a demo, but he absolutely loved it. You know, yeah. So the beauty with the F Type is we had a lot of fun with it because the roof came down. It's also got uh, animating air vents that pop up on the front. You could start the car and get the audio, and we really went to town on the consumer experience and made it fun to explore the car which I think is key. It's not really, I think in the future, it's not just about configuring your car, it's about exploring it and having fun with it. And that creates a much more engaging experience for the consumer. So back in that motor show, what was that experience like, Darren? What was the technology that they put forward? Uh, so, so it was uh, PC-based. Uh, you had fundamentally an iPad to control the configuration, so you selected all the options on an iPad. And then you also had a motion sensing camera. So as you were looking at the car, as you moved left and right, the car also moved left and right. And when you went inside the car, it moved to head tracking, so you could literally sit in the seat and look around you at all the, di at all the, different, all the different elements. Uh, the car was displayed life-size on 1080 screens. There was something like six 1080 screens, so the car was life-size. And because when you moved, the car moved, and it's obviously a lifelike size, you get this weird suspension of belief where after a while you think you're, in, you, you, you think you're interacting with the car you're going to buy, and that's exactly the sweet spot that we were aiming for. Right. So was this using the headsets or the sort of VR stuff? No. So at this stage, it was um, just big screens. Right. But obviously, since then, we've done a lot of work with Audi most recently at the uh, CES in Las Vegas in January, where we did the Audi walking VR experience, where fundamentally a user puts on a virtual reality headset, an HTC Vive, and the car is in the room with them, and they can actually walk around the vehicle as if it's there. So it's actually a, it's it's virtual reality where you can move around inside the world, which is like so you need a big empty room. You fundamentally, you need a big a big empty space, cushioned walls. Yeah, but it, it, it's yeah, it, it's, it's surprising. We I, I did a talk this week. I went to one of the junior schools. And did a talk to did a talk to the kids, and obviously we get used to look, looking <laughs> at virtual reality stuff. And the first thing this ten year old did was obviously walk straight into a wall with a headset <laughs> on. And it's just you, you just it's it's you just get used to virtual reality. But to most people, it's like c coming from another planet. You know, it's 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 such a different experience to to. Um, to what people are used to currently, but it will become more and more mass market. Why did you go from, uh, you know, the the screen technology to VR? Was that a natural transition, or was that something the the customers, you know, your clients pushed you onto? Or so so there's so Audi are definitely Vorsprung Dirk technique. You know, the 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 the. the, the they definitely want to be in the, on the, the cutting edge of everything that they do. And they had a look at virtual reality, and I think they understood how important virtual reality was going to be and how much how much of an immersive experience that can be for somebody who's interested in buying a high-ticket high ticket value item. Um, so, But what they needed, they need, you need really, really fast performance of the technology in virtual reality. So in HTC Vive, it um, functions at 90 frames per second with less than 20 millisecond delay. Now, that's the, although that's a load of technology, what it fundamentally means is when you have the headset on, you don't feel ill at all. And that's a bit, as soon as your frame rate drops, so you imagine if you move your head left and right and it drags, it's like you feel drunk. You know, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you've had a drink and you feel like your head's slightly behind your actual eyes, uh, that's the problem that you need to solve. So you need really, really super fast technology. And they realized with the technology provider they had at that time, they weren't 
going to be able to get there, but they realized that using our game technology, they would be able to get there. So, so literally right now, Audi has got the sort of acknowledged world-leading uh, VR solutions created by Zero Light. You know, when you see VR examples down, sometimes it's kind of like maybe a roller coaster or something, which I would imagine that frames per second would, would, would impact on. But when you're standing station with a car, why, why is that important? Is it because you just kind of, you're all looking around, up and down around the, the cabin of the car? Or? Yeah, I mean, if, if you if people listen to Google, the uh, Audi VR experience at CES, you, there's actually a great video of somebody using it. And he's literally on his hands and knees looking under the car, right. he's sticking his head into the engine and looking at the cylinders and, and all this sort of stuff. And a major part for us is if you're going to do virtual reality, it has to be better than reality. You should be able to do things in it that you can't do in reality. And I think that's what a lot of people don't get about VR is that just recreating reality is not very exciting. You need to be able to do different things. You need to be able to grab the wheel and pull it off and throw it away and all this sort of stuff. That's when virtual reality gets really, really exciting. And and fundamentally, you just need good technology to do it. Otherwise, otherwise it can make you feel nauseous. You've got Audi. You've done Audi, yeah? yeah. You've been involved in Jaguar. Yeah. Where are we going from here? So um, we've signed Pagani, the uh, supercar manufacturer. So we're doing all of their all their digital showrooms, and we went across to uh, Pebble Beach to launch the solution with Mr. Pagani's Mr. Pagani's new vehicle. And we've just come back from Geneva Motor Show. Uh, these cars are two and a half million dollars each, so they're proper works of art, as well as being awesome cars. They're works of art, and what Mr. Pagani's doing, he's got a new car coming out, and believe it or not, he's actually going to sell that digitally to his customer base before they actually before he's produced the real car. So right now we had people at Geneva that were specifying a car using software before they've actually ever seen the car. You know, in the future, Darren, do do people still go to car showrooms or do they do this in their own home? Bit of both, or uh, I think a bit of both. Certainly, um, car showrooms are going to become more of a destination. So a decade ago, the average person went into a car dealership nine times before buying. Uh, from research last year, the person goes in less than one and a half times. So the car manufacturers know that they're, they're losing that footfall, and pretty much people are doing um, a lot of that research work via the internet now. So the person who walks through the door, they know is interested and has done their research and is a very, very well-informed well informed consumer. So I think what the car manufacturers need the dealerships for logistics, for test drives, for servicing, for uh, pre-delivery inspections and all this sort of stuff. So you're not going to see car dealers disappear. But what you're going to get, I think, is more like logistics centers as an average dealership. And then you're going to get things like um, Audi City as being more destinations, which are digital dealerships. And they might have, say, virtual reality in them or augmented reality. That's a reason for you to go there and, and experience it. It's interesting, those stats, you know, from nine to one and a half times. You know, did you think things like, you know, Top Gear and What Car and all the reviews are on there? People are doing all the homework online. They get a good idea of what they want and then they just go in the showroom. Is that the, is that the idea? Yeah, so, so literally 50% of people um, use the car manufacturer's websites to uh, research their vehicles. However, 92% of people research the cars online. So the car manufacturers know that, the, that somehow this 42% of people are using other sites like Car Wow. Uh, they find out what Jeremy Clarkson thinks of the vehicle and all this stuff. They're going in with a target price. They know what the price they should be paying in. And the car manufacturers really need to reclaim that ground. So what we've done is we've enhanced the 2D car configuration experience that you normally get online. So most uh, car manufacturers have got um, a sort of like what we call Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs car configuration, <laughs> which is it's a, it's a collection of static images. And as you scroll left and right, those static images move around like a clockwork, like a, like a clockwork toy. 
and it's just not a great not a great experience and pretty soon you run out of images because there's that many possible billions of combinations of colors and wheels and interiors and options that it can't show them all on the website so we've just launched literally this week on audi.de the zero light solution which is without a plug-in and what it does it replaces those fundamentally static images with an interactive video that contains a real-time generated car that you can actually configure and it almost gives the web a better user experience than you can even get in a dealer and what this should do is 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 move the point of engagement further in the car manufacturer's direction. Let's hear a quick word from our sponsors. Far North are a sales and marketing consultancy with one aim, to grow your organisation. If you're looking to increase sales, maybe a new financial year is approaching, get in touch and experience our one-day business modelling workshop to create a bird's eye view of your business plan. Check us out over at far-north.co.uk. Now, back to Darren Jobling. Is the pricing going to be more uh, transparent now? I mean, you know, buying a car used to be putting people off. You know, you're saying that you've got a target price, but there's nothing worse than having to barter in showrooms. It's, you know, a lot of people, especially in Britain, don't like doing that. Do you think we're going to have more transparent pricing now with, with customization? Yeah, I think it's um, it's an outdated process. It's like bartering in a market. And I think one of the problems for me is you could walk out and have the best you could achieve the best deal that was possible buying a new car so you've negotiated the best deal possible and you walk out there and you still feel you could have got a better deal and that's that's a huge issue and the car manufacturers know it's a huge issue so i think one of the things that they need to solve is fixed pricing you know that that's the price and that's what you that's what you pay fixed pricing would then allow people to do things like purchase cars online it, it's a mass it's a massive issue this variable pricing and it's one of the things that they need to solve before they can before they can actually move on on the online sales you know you've got the ear of some fantastic car manufacturers designers do the do the company and do they sort of say you know could we help you with pricing what do you think of this you know do they use you for that or we're strictly for um visualization aspects of it and strategy and our big thing is omni-channel delivery so what fundamentally audi has now is uh the almost like the netflix of the car industry most car manufacturers have got what we call a dysfunctional digital pipeline. So they, they have a one model produced but digitally, but then they give that to a web agency who go around click creating these 2D images. They give it to an app developer who goes around creating an app. And they give it to various other agencies. And each time, that person is creating a new car. And that creates, it costs them additional money, it costs them additional QA, and it costs them additional approvals. And then the car that you see on the web is different to the car that you see in the app, and it's different to the car that you see in the in the showroom. What we've done with for the likes of Audi is you take the one model and then you just output it via the omni channel. So the same, you see exactly the same car on the web, exactly the same car on your mobile, exactly the same car on the tablet, exactly the same car in virtual reality, and exactly the same car in things like virtual showrooms when you go to the go to the dealer. And what that does, as well as giving a much much better user experience it also offers a cost saving to the car manufacturer because they get rid of all that duplication thinking about all those various different you know customizations does that get fed back in terms of metrics so do audi kind of know right everybody's looking for a red leather you know everyone's looking for these amount of wheels do those metrics go back yeah so, so there's a whole analytics back end so so so, so literally um say say if, you, if you're looking at a car and we'll know that you like the blue car with the red interior for instance the next time you get a communication from the manufacturer you see a red car with a blue a, a, sorry a blue car with a red interior you know that's what we that's what we deliver so there's full back end in terms of analytics and again that comes from the games industry so in the games industry you spend a lot of time especially in the free to play industry looking at what the consumers are doing all the time and making choices based on the on that information that's exactly the same 
we've brought that technology across into the car manufacturers, which is a bit of, a bit a little bit of a revelation to them because mm. they don't actually track a lot of what's going on in terms of the uh, the actual configuration process because they're, they're just displaying two d images. Sure. And I would imagine would that go back into sales or you know depending on how many um, consumers have customized the big kit, would they go back and say, you know, our pipeline looks, you know, really large this this month because there's lots of customizations going on. And- yeah, so, so I think what you what you're gonna get in future is in the similar thing to what we're doing with Mr. Pagani. Say, so if if a manufacturer has a new car, they can actually put it out up on the web as an interactive experience that people can can go through and configure the car before it even exists and then they'll know that 75 percent of people like the car in white 10 percent in silver and the rest in black and that allows them to 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 form informed decisions you know in terms of their marketing campaign the car should be silver etc etc do you know is what i'm thinking about now is your place let's talk about zero light itself I guess the people are super important in, in an industry like this. You must have a, a good culture within the organization. Yeah. So, I mean, basically, as as in most companies, the people are absolutely key. We've got a um, – we're big graduate trainers, so we work with all the local universities and also national universities and international universities in um, – in bringing in sort of the best graduate talent and training it, training it up. So literally on my executive team, over fifty percent of them started as young graduates, and they've actually worked their way worked their way through through the uh, basically through the through the company and grown with us. Um, and, and and that's the reputation we have. So we've got a reputation worldwide as we historically we did have as year technics, and we have as well as year light as being great graduate trainers it's not unusual for people to go to our competitors and they say right okay go off get trained by zero lights and then come back and then come and then we'll give give you a job so it's i mean competition's tough to get in but once literally we're obviously like most we're after the very, the very best in the world but i think what we're really good at is convincing people you can stay in the northeast of england you can be in technology but you can be the uh the you can be the best that you can be. You can be a world leader from the northeast of England. There is no barriers. You know, you don't have you don't have to leave the northeast and go to Silicon Valley to be a world leader. So sitting here from from sort of in Gateshead, we've got um, deals in Japan, deals all over, all over Europe, and also deals with motor manufacturers in the US. And that's all coming from out of Gateshead. Thinking about you personally, Darren, you know, you're bringing in lots of young graduates there with obviously learning the latest technology how do you keep yourself on, on top of your game you know how do you keep yourself learning with you know about the technology about business no, nothing nothing motivates me more than looking at like what what the teams are producing here and the the great technology but to be honest i do rely on them you know that they the they tend to be younger than me the the, the more in touch with what the, what what youth is looking at in terms of in terms of in terms of technology and they're really the they're really the smart ones what i do is just look at what they're producing and just think how we can how we can commercialize that and I think with a lot of startups, that's maybe the missing link. So a lot of people have got absolutely great technology and they think that, hey, if we build it, they will come. And unfortunately, the world isn't like that. You do need to have commercial people who also can can take great ideas and commercialize them and, and explain them in a way that lay people can understand. It's funny, you know, you're talking about youth. Um, my mind was thinking about my boy. He's... Um you know, a lot of the lads his age, they go on Grand Theft Auto, but back in the day when those cars, for, those games first came out, you know, you'd be doing missions and the music and the handling of the car. Now they just want to put it in the body shop, customize it, and then take a YouTube video and post it up there. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's definitely the way the way it's heading. It's, it's all about um, customization, personalization. And that's really what the zero light technology offers on the web. So you can't really, when you're looking at a two D static image, it it doesn't really sum up, you know, your your car. And it doesn't get you engaged. It's just a, a a simple representation of what your car might look like. With zero light, you can actually specify the full car. If you like uh, cycling, you can have cycle racks on. If you go camping, you can have roof racks fitted. If you can, uh, if you've got kids, you can have child seats fitted, and, and you can get, get and you can get your exact car 
you can put it out on the road you can take it all sorts of places in the world and, and photograph it you can then propagate that by uh, tweeting it out in twitter put posting it to your facebook wall uh, creating youtube videos and that's what people that's what people want you know people want to be able to have that 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 custom experience and the fact they can get it in games but the people that produce the cars weren't aren't able to do it was just something that just needed to be put right and because of the advances in graphical quality the uh the the, the quality achieved is now is now acceptable to the car manufacturers so the, these car manufacturers I think we mentioned audi pagini pagani sorry um world domination is that next darren are you going to be i bet you've got some good pipeline there and you just trying to get them over the line as yes yeah, so um car manufacturers generally are um amazing companies but obviously they're quite slow to react so it's quite a lot compared to the games industry games are super super quick so so that's taken us a little bit of time to get used to is that fundamentally the, the work that we're doing 12 months ago comes to fruition about now 12 months later um so literally we've got unannounced deals with another uh, three or four car manufacturers so so and fundamentally what we're doing is building the zero light platform so just giving an omni channel where a car manufacturer can come upload their upload, upload their vehicle and then see it in var- various output formats so that's the that's the direction that we're heading what, is there anybody that's influenced you in this role Darren at all uh, yeah so obviously I worked I worked a, a long time with my younger brother Brian Jobling who started the who started your technics and he's the he's the he's the he's the technology guy so we've been a team for uh, a, a, a good few a good few years um, and also it, it's just really important to get good advisors in um um a, a great a great uh, believer in investing in, in legal especially when it comes to your intellectual property and making sure that you're you're sort of well protected it, it costs a lot of, lots and lots of money to create and you need to you need to protect it so so it's it's literally i think the thing that inspires us most funny enough is the workforce you know the people that you employ the creative stuff that they come up with is is really the thing that keeps us young Excellent. That's a great tip, you know, in terms of legal, I guess, expertise, you have to go outside and bring a third party in for any area of expertise you don't have in house. Yeah, I think it's really interesting. I've never, ever had any advice from an accountant apart from there's no option, you've got to pay the tax. So, so, so I've never, you know, there's, there's, no, there's no way you can escape taxation and death. As, as the as the old saying goes. However, on legal, you know, quite a few times um, in the obviously we've We've bought companies, we've sold the companies, we've done buy-in, management buyouts, and this sort of thing. And it's amazing if you invest in good legal advice, how that can pay massive dividends down the line. Brilliant. Nice, nice bit of knowledge to leave us with. Well, Darren, thanks very much for your time. It's been a great insight in, into the world of Zero Light, and uh, best of luck going forward. Cheers, Ian. Great pleasure to talk to you. I thoroughly enjoyed speaking with Darren there. Let me know your thoughts. I've had the privilege to see their technology firsthand and it's amazing. I'll put some links up on the show notes as our words probably won't do it justice. It's something you have to see for yourself. And maybe we all will one day when configuring a next car. So until next time, I'm Ian Farrer and thanks for listening to The Industry Angel. 